Hello. Hi. <laughs> you know, uh, before we get into like all the great, fabulous solo stuff you've done in the last couple of years, I was hoping that we could go back uh, a little bit and talk about some other things in your life to get started. Like I know you grew up in Southern California, I think Long Beach. Yeah. And, <laughs> what, what was it like growing up there for you? Oh, it was so much fun. Long Beach is, or at least was, I don't know how it is these days, but a great place to grow up. You know, we, we were at the beach every weekend, um, longboarding, you know, skateboarding, surfing, all that good stuff. Just, you know, a lot of cool activities to do. And I mean, it's a, the area I grew up in was very much a suburb. So, you know, you just walk to your friend's house and get in trouble. It was a really fine childhood, you know, like I, I don't have like a lot of negative kind of feelings towards that. And I feel very blessed to have had a good childhood. When you say it was the suburbs, so you weren't right in Long Beach, you were like, I lived in LA for 14 years. So I kind of know the area, Orange County. Uh, no, because Orange County is separate. Long Beach is still a part of Los Angeles County. Right. But Long Beach is massive. So you've got downtown Long Beach, you know, where there's uh, Pine Street and Ocean and uh, a lot of more like skyscrapers, big buildings and stuff right. like that. But then you get closer to, say, Cal State Long Beach, which is where my family lived. And it's it's totally suburbia and um, just a lot of single family homes, schools, churches. Like, I know that your sister, I was going to talk about her, It was a music, is a musician also. What, what was it like your family? Was your family very musical or in entertainment? Or was it just your sister? Liza? Liza, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Older sister, Liza. Um, well, my mom loves rock and roll, and she's always been a badass in that way. She grew up in Northern California, um, outside of Oakland and San Francisco. So she was actually kind of a part of that punk scene around there and um she just loved rock and roll was always going to concerts um taking us to concerts but she doesn't have a musical bone uh she's more of an appreciator mm -hmm. of that um but i mean we had great records in the house growing up you know beatles led zeppelin acdc black sabbath you know there was always really cool music being played in our house um and actually it was our stepdad who played drums and a little bit of guitar. So those instruments were in the house when we were growing oh. up. And that's really what got my older sister started on guitar. You know, she picked it up one day and then that led to her teaching me how to play guitar. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, very lucky that we had access to that stuff because, you know, if it's not around, I guess you really have to seek it out, you know, and I was always involved with, uh, sports at school and just being really active and my sister is more like the studious type so she took to you know really focusing on an instrument whereas I was like oh so you say if I learn guitar then I get to get dressed up and go to shows mm -hmm. and be cool um, so that was more of my motivation at 15 to learn how to play the instrument was more like a means to an end you know just to have exciting stuff going on in my life um, but I have much more of an appreciation for the instrument now. You, you mentioned, I'm going to ask you about that because I know you're a lefty, but I, I'm going to save that for a second. Um, when did you start to get, I mean, you mentioned the classic rock and all that. When it, when did the punk come in? Was that because of Savat? Savat was your sister's band. Was that when you all of a sudden became more in tune to like, oh, maybe punk is my thing, you know? Yeah, it's weird because punk just it just kind of was there um, from a very early age because my sister and I are five years apart. Oh. She she was already into that stuff by the time I was 10, you know, and so I was just hearing it. Um, it wasn't like this is punk. This is something different. It's just, oh, we're listening to the cramps today or, oh, we're listening to uh, Dwayne Peters, you know, but. Um, it wasn't just punk being played in our house, nor was that all that my sister listened to. And still to this day, I would say I listen to a lot less punk rock than I do other genres of music. You know, if I'm in the car, I'm listening to the classical musical st station. You know, I'm listening to classic music, um, not 
punk rock usually because I play it. So it's just a lot, you know, um, but um, it just was there. And, you know, she was really cool about teaching me different bands. And some of my very early memories of punk rock were going to backyard parties and warehouse shows you know, and small all ages DIY venues, you know, she would just kind of push me into the mosh pit. And so that was just totally normal to me. You know, it didn't seem like this fringe sort of um, culture, you know, because it was just around all the time. And right. I felt very much at home with those people in that scene. So it wasn't like something that I had to really actively seek out. It was just kind of there for me, which does lead me to believe that I was meant to be a part of this and it was meant to be a part of my life. Uh, it's really interesting to me that you're left-handed and I have to talk to you about this because I was wondering if you realized that right away. Did someone hand you a right-handed guitar and you realize, wait a second, I can't play that. I need a left-handed guitar. How did that all happen? That's exactly what happened. Um, I'm the only left-handed person in my family. And so that guitar that my sister inherited from our stepdad, it was a right-handed guitar. And she tried to teach me a few chords. And, you know, I sat with it for some weeks, you know, I'm like, wow, this is really <laughs> uncomfortable. It doesn't feel right at all. Maybe I'm just not a guitar player. Maybe it's not for me, you know. Um, and then one day I realized that when I was just playing air guitar to a song on the radio, that my hands were going the other direction, you know, and, and I went up to her and it didn't even occur to me that that was a thing. I mean, I was very young, so there, I wasn't super into Jimi Hendrix or Kurt Cobain, you know, like I wasn't aware that left handed guitar players mm -hmm. was, you know, and she was like, oh, yeah, that's OK. Yeah, you're right. You're left handed. So maybe we. uh flip it around, restring it and give it another shot. And it felt so much better. Uh, when, did, just, when did you get your first real left-handed guitar? When I was 15, my mom took us to the local music store and they had one option <laughs> for lefty, which still to this day, every time I go into a music store, I kind of take a look around and I'm like, mm -hmm, one option. That's if you're lucky. Usually there are no left-handed guitars available, you know, so I didn't, it was not like I was able to pick my dream guitar, you know, it's like, no, you get uh, like, you know, the shitty uh, Mexican made Fender, you know, and like, I still have that guitar to this day and I love it. It's a backup guitar for me. I have my main guitar, which is, you know, a custom built uh, Fender Strat that I designed and, you know, that's my, that's my baby, but that original guitar just has so much uh meaning to me you know mm -hmm. and shit you know i just i didn't know like what a good guitar was even so i was just lucky to have anything <laughs> i i really i know the minute i saw you you know when i first saw you years ago i she's left-handed you know and you don't see that very much so i had to ask you about that um yeah, well, you matter i had no choice in the matter <laughs> you know become you know, it's, it's just, it's not something I think about as being cool or unique or special. It's just the way I'm built, you know, and I play guitar just like everybody else, probably worse <laughs> than most. I wouldn't say and, that. You know, um, it's just because I'm not, I'm not like a super enthusiastic guitar geek, you know, and th that is definitely some people's thing. For me, I need that tool basically to write songs songs are my real passion yeah i like song melodies harmonies these little moments and texture things and you know i hear that stuff in my head and the guitar is the tool that i use to paint the picture you know but if you were to ask me like what kind of pickup my fiance put in my guitar i'd be like i don't know it's a pickup and it turns on and it sounds good you know <laughs> now, now you joined Savat when you're about 15, was it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was that all? What was that experience like for you? Oh, it was awesome. You know, uh, like I said, that was just normal to me. You know, um, my sister had already had the band for five years by the time that I joined. So she did a lot of groundwork as far mm -hmm. as songwriting and getting the name out, you know, enough to have consistent shows to play. And, 
once I started playing, we were playing at clubs that, you know, I knew the owners because I was the little kid that was there like two years ago, you know? Um, so I just, I loved everything about being in Civet though. Um, as far as like the girl group dynamic, mm -hmm. really fun to share, um, to share that experience with other women and like, I love the boys in my band now and I, I really just get along so well. I get along well w with both, you know, but um, there is something very special about, about getting dolled up together and sharing this kind of like special secret little like group, you know, and it's like you against the world, this little crew. Um, so I had so much fun and getting to tour with my sister is so special. And uh, there were a few times where, we took our younger brother on tour with us too. So you've got all three kids nice. touring together. Um, and my mom was always very supportive of the dream and encouraged us and definitely funded things when money was tight and helped out in that. But she's just always completely believed in me. And um, so, yeah, I learned a lot, you know, just more like the business side of being in a band and how to be a professional and, what things are going to get you uh, not asked back to perform at a club or to work with certain people, you know? Um, so just from a very early age, I was kind of thrust into a professional setting and I appreciate that side of music because it's not, it can be fun and games and some people do see it as a hobby, but other sorts of artists take it seriously. It's their livelihood. And that's how I've always approached it. And, you know, then uh, after Savet, Turbulent Hearts, which you had a really good run with that band, um, uh, the, the cra I remember the Crazy Girl video. Yeah, and I was like, yeah. wow, this is good. <laughs> cool. I, and that yeah. song, I Don't Do It For You, I still have that on playlist, you know. So I really oh, like that band. Thank you. Yeah, you know, that was like my Savet, right? Like that was my first real band that I was running the show. Um when it comes to Savette, I mean, that's my sister's band. She right. created that, that vision. That was her thing. And I'm very thankful that I got to go along on the ride. And she taught me as much as she did. But with Turbulent Hearts, you know, I had taken a break from Savette. And I was like, oh, I'm never going to play music again. I have to be a normal person, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that didn't last more than a year and a half, really, before <laughs> that itch to write songs came back and I had never been a band leader before. I'd never been a front person. Um, I'd never told other people how to play my songs, you know? Um, so stepping into that role was absolutely fucking terrifying. And I'm so thankful that I got to play with Mark Johnson and Jay Skoronek. They were my core group in Turbulent Hearts. We had a few, um, Good, like fourth guitar second guitar players fourth members come in and out of the band and that just didn't ever seem quite right we were definitely a three-piece you mm -hmm. know and that was a band where like I just got to learn so much and really experiment with my songwriting those guys were always down to try any kind of song that I wanted to and that's why there's a lot of variation in the Turbulent Hearts uh, discography is because I was throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing, you know, if that worked and if that represented me and like, what, what am I capable of? And there was a very like safe environment to just try whatever, you know, um, and also get a lot of experience being a front woman and commanding the stage, you know, and, um, running the band all on my own. <laughs> you were still pretty young too. Yeah, I was 24 when I started Turbulent Hearts. 20, so, oh, wow. I didn't realize. I think. That was about to be, that's going to be 10 years. Wow. Yeah, um, yeah. I have to ask you about L.A. Machina. I know it wasn't a project that lasted very long, but I know, you know, I, I was familiar with all three of you. Um, yeah. Michelle and Ricky Sticks. I love Ricky Sticks. And yeah. Um, was that plan? Were you planning on that being a one-off project or was that a band that I know it was during the pandemic. So I have a feeling that that could have affected the whole thing. Can you talk about that whole experience? Cause I thought you guys were great. Thank you. Yeah. I'm very proud of LA Machina. I wish that that band had gone further and done more. There's a, there's an entire LA Machina full length record that yeah. the world will hear oh, that really? we, 
that we invested money into and a lot of time and a lot of rehearsal, a lot of resources were pulled to make that band um, happen. And, you know, when you've got a three piece and it's uh, there's not one person who's leading the project, if one person doesn't want to do what the other two people want to do, it could really throw a wrench in the entire thing. And let's just say Ricky and I are still really good friends. <laughs> um, Ricky and I are very close and we will always be close, you know, but um, we, we put everything we had into that band and it was really depressing when somebody pulled the plug on it. So you know, um, it was a great experience for me. Again, going back to playing with other women was so much fun. I was just thinking about this the other day, how much fun I had with L.A. Machina and coming up with. I was more on the, the visual side of the, the concepts, you know, like the album art and the um, the makeup and the, the all the online imagery and all of that stuff. You know, everyone kind of had their role that they played. Ricky is just a fabulous businesswoman and really knows how to like crunch numbers, look at things, do things in a really smart way. And Michelle is a very talented songwriter and enigmatic person, you know, and in a perfect world, we could have done something bigger than what we did, but I'm not going to fight God on it. You know, he had a plan and where I am now, I think is actually exactly where I'm supposed to be. And that was a really good palate cleanser between Turbulent Hearts and Susie Moon, there was enough time where it wasn't like, it's all about me and now it's all about me, but I changed the name back to my own name. And like, you know, it was just like a really nice thing to break up uh, being a, a band leader and joining something where I was a part of a group again, you know, in, in a different way. And I got to play bass, which is so yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Uh, those, those, those videos, uh, Highway of the Night and Go. Yeah really really good videos i mean we when you said that the visual part and stuff that was you did you have a lot to do with the videos because i know Actually, you love videos i do love videos and i do tend to take control on projects like that i would say more on the wardrobe side of things right. the two videos we worked with a friend of ours who we we I, and i i've worked with him he did the gold record autograph video for Susie Moon mm -hmm. and place in hell video for Susie Moon. Um, but he's the kind of guy where you let him take his ideas and run with them because he's just incredibly talented. And um, again, you know, it was just one of those things where a lot of stuff moved very quickly with LA Machina. Um, we got together and then we were making videos in the studio. We got punk rock bowling, yeah. you know, just, uh, blazing fast and then the pandemic definitely didn't help at all um, but we did have plans for post pandemic that just didn't see the light of day you know I you know I I'm kind of connected in a way because I, I I used to manage the love me knots and Nicole oh. from the love me knots played you know Michelle and Ricky were in the first version of the darts so I remember when that whole thing came together and uh, I don't know it, it, I'm not going to say, I don't want to get anybody upset, but there's certain, I think you know what I'm talking about. You Sometimes you get people in bands and they just have their heads in different places and it doesn't work out. And I figured that that was what happened. Um, but I'm well, happy for Ricky now though, because she's got, you know, DVG, you know, Death Valley Girls are really good. And she seems to like have a place now with that mm -hmm. band. But the I, I love Death Valley Girls. I'm a huge fan and watching uh, Ricky ascend with them brings me so much joy because she's in a place where she's totally respected and appreciated and she gets to play high caliber shows with really good people, yeah. you know, and that's the kind of energy she needs to be around and you can't, you can't really be a shining light when you're around people that want to bring it down and aren't shining themselves, you know? And um, i just think that both Ricky and I, we, we are where we're supposed to be and we can only wish the best for people who might not be. Where I couldn't, I couldn't avoid LA machine. I had to bring it up. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I have absolutely no 
problem talking about it. I mean, I'm very proud of that project. And something that most people don't know is that, you know, Michelle wrote half of the songs and then I wrote the other half of the songs. And I ended up taking back um, some songs that we had demoed together. And those became the first Susie Moon release. And that's why Ricky Sticks plays drums on all the three songs on Call the Shots. Yeah. It's because those were LA Machina recordings. You know, we had gone into the studio to do that. And LA Machina was um, talking with Pirates Press Records about putting out the full length. You know, I didn't we had realize that was a Pirate Press company. <laughs> that's <laughs> cool. That's my favorite mug. It holds so much <laughs> coffee. It's just perfect. Uh, you know, and when LA Machina started to fizzle out, Lo and behold, uh, Pirates Press Records, their favorite songs from the L.A. Machina record were the songs that I had written. So they said, well, do you want to do this? And I was like, oh, God, this is not something I had prepared for at all. (laughs) Not at all what I was expecting to do. Um, But it just seemed totally divinely guided that they liked what I was doing a lot. And Ricky gave me her blessing with her her drum tracks and said, get that shit across the finish line, you know, and let's not waste those recordings and that money and that time we spent. And I love you. And I was like, I love you, you know, (laughs) and, um, you know, and shit, it just came together in a really organic way. Um, you have really great fashion sense, which, you know, this, this, I usually take the zoom, uh, interviews and put them on YouTube. So everyone will see that. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, I, was was it always your plan to 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 deliver the image with the music as you headed down the solo career path? Because it seems like you've gotten more fashionable. <laughs> as not to say that you never were not, because you've always have been, but now you've really taken it to the next level. Thank you. Um, well, I appreciate you noticing that because I think it is important to have a strong image for any musical group, whether it's an anti-fashion sort of statement or a super fashionable statement, you know, it's a, it helps to kind of connect the dots for the listeners and the people at the show, you know, and um, give them like a more fully kind of well-rounded idea of what the project is about. Um, I had, fuck, those years I was in Turbulent Hearts, I was trying so hard to be like everybody else wearing sneakers and jeans mm. and it, on stage i felt fat and ugly and uncomfortable and not good i look back on some of those turbulent heart, those are some of the worst out- outfits i've ever worn in my entire life and you'll see sometimes where i'm trying to kind of marry the two you know a little bit of like <laughs> and i would dress up very glamorously any other night of the week, if I was going to a concert or going out with my friends or whatever, that's always been my way. But when it came to getting on stage, I felt like I had to go in the opposite direction to be taken seriously as a punk rock and roller, you know, and um, something just kind of clicked. And actually, I would say that the pandemic really helped me in that sense, because taking a step back from like the social pressures of like, oh, this is what I feel like people want to see a woman with a guitar wearing, you know, Uh, and just actually kind of going back into my bubble a bit and creating a lot of the Suzy Moon solo imagery and videos away from the real public eye, you know, and I was still in this like little bubble of mine. Um, I was like, well, there's no turning back because I've fully embraced who I've always been, you know? And, um, and even still with Susie Moon, it took me a good year to really kind of like dial in exactly what I've always wanted to be on stage, but still finding that confidence to, you know, allow like my true self to shine, you know, ever since I was a really little kid, you know, I was obsessed with old Hollywood, burlesque pinup girls fashion you know I just pouring over Vogue magazines you know but um, then you see people like uh, Dwayne Peters and Corey Parks who were this awesome punk rock couple 
in Die Huns, you know, and Sivette was signed to Dwayne's label, Disaster Records. And I remember them showing up in all these like custom spray painted clothes and stuff, you know, so there's kind of like this mix of like punk rock um like and everything i i sew myself you know and it's not done on a machine i crudely sew by hand you know and i'm pinning things here and pinning things there and deconstructing things and you know putting them back together and um so there's like yeah my own kind of personal mix of like high fashion and like gutter glitter like rock and roll stuff and I guess it's true what they say about like when you hit your 30s you kind of just understand yourself a bit more you know and as you get older that happens mm -hmm. and I really just feel like I'm really truly like I've come into my own in the last couple of years and I I just feel at peace with who I am and how I like to present myself and it makes me feel good. I'm a big fan of the English glam uh, scene from the early 70s, you know, Bowie, Queen, Mata Hoople. So, you know, I appreciate fashion. <laughs> and, oh. you know, and I've, you know, any band I ever worked with in my life, I've always said, you know, you just, you, you don't have to just wear jeans and t-shirts. Come on, make it. I like costumes. I like outfits. So I appreciate what you're doing very much. And there's a if the people out there listening, there's a lot of videos on YouTube of Susie that you can see all these outfits. And very rarely <laughs> do I see you in the same outfit. No, you probably won't. <laughs> I, I I would never rewear an outfit in a photo or a video shoot. I might cut it up and change it and make it totally different for the next time. But I've always been that way. Um, even in Savet, I was very. Um, like just a hyper aware of um like costumes and stuff and we did have a cohesive look in Civet. it was uh kind of like a 50s sort of like girl gang thing with the mm -hmm. pencils i guess when i did start turbulent hearts a lot of me was really rejecting that too and going it completely in the opposite direction you know it's like it's like um what is that um that fairy tale with the three little bears or whatever or whatever she's trying to you know what i'm saying it's like the porridge one where it's, it's not too hot not too cold yeah, you know? yeah and it's like okay so that was a lot and i don't want to feel like i'm in civet anymore you know but, but i was still exploring and it, it does it takes a lot of time and a lot of um self-reflection and just work and uh, losing some fucks letting them fly away you know and it's so some of us fans like to see a show you know we don't need to see we want to see a show you know yeah and you know we're doing a job even though it's the greatest job in the world it's so fun to play music you know and we're just extremely lucky to get to perform and be in a space where people are um you know appreciative of the work that you're doing and there's like this shared energy thing and like all these feelings and it's so positive and really cool you know but I'm showing up to work when I go to do a show you know and I don't want to be Susie Moon in Rhinestones 24 7 I would go fucking crazy you know so there's like there's now there's like this kind of separation where I I get into costume and then I'm ready for the show like mentally you know it's like it's really it's been really good for my mental health in the last couple of years is to kind of separate the two you know I love it the last two years okay two great EPs and now you've got this great full length dumb and in love you must be pretty happy with the way you're being treated by pirate because you're doing a lot in two years that's pretty good that's a lot yeah, thank you. They are just the best fucking label. And I like I'm just so grateful for them because they've really encouraged me, um, especially Veek, Veek Martin, who's at the label. And she's really the one I'm in the most contact with. And we talk every couple of days. You know, she right from the get go was very supportive of the direction I wanted to take this, you know, and that I. I was doing something a little bit different visually and she was like, fucking go for it. Like, I'm so into this, you know, like just do it. And I was like, Oh, okay. It's not too much. Okay. All right. You know, and just to have that support from your label, instead of them telling you what you should be looking like or doing or releasing, 
you know, I've just had their full support and um, they're just really good people. You know, at the end of the day, they're just really good people who believe in punk rock and are doing their part to give back to the punk rock community as a whole, yeah. you know? And um, I mean, how pirates were pirates. It's so freaking cool. You couldn't be with a cooler crew, you know? And um, <laughs> it just feels like the right place to be. And I want to make them proud and do good work. So they're not wasting their fucking time. You know, the, the next couple of things I want to talk to you about are pretty related. Now the song in the video for California Mm-hmm. really really good pop song i mean do, do you do you see yourself going in a more popular direction or did that just happen how did that all happen because you have a lot of really loud aggressive songs and then when i heard california i was like holy shit and then i saw the video mm-hmm. blew me away cool cool that's really nice to hear um i've always loved pop you know, I'm I'm going to be 34 this year. So when I grew up, Spice Girls and Britney Spears were pretty much the biggest artists in the world. Mm-hmm. And I love them, you know, and I still love them. <laughs> uh, I appreciate a great pop song. You know, it's that there's that magical thing. It's like, how do they how do they make it so damn catchy? You know, um, and my entire journey as a songwriter has been about finding that confidence right to just be the artist that I am um I'm I never sit down and consciously go I'm gonna write a poppy California kind of like hit sounding thing you know for me I don't think I'm really all that special and no musician truly is the songs are up there Mm -hmm. you know you tap in or clock in to work and if you're kind of on that level um ideas will come to you you know and with the song california it came to me while i was running laps around the rose bowl in pasadena you know and you you don't turn a melody like that away you know um that's just rude the music gods don't like that stuff you know and so it's my job to see it through and to do the best i can with the ideas that are given to me you know um and I think it would have done the song like it wouldn't have done the song justice to try to toughen it up. You know, it's just not that kind of song. There's a time and a place for cheesy and cheesy makes us feel good. You know, it doesn't need to be all really heavy and dark. There's a time and a place for that too. Just as easily as California came to me, so did the song animal and they really couldn't be more different. But when a, exactly, you know, when a, when a song, comes to you it's your job to follow through and to do the song justice you know um i love doo-wop classic rock you know psych rock garage rock pop music you know it's just all across the board i just appreciate a great song you know so i wouldn't say that there's a limit on what i can do it would be that limit would be self-imposed by me stopping pushing myself to just make a good song when I've got the basic uh, blueprint there, you know, and I definitely wrestled with California, you know, cause I knew it was really good when I wrote it. I was like, what, this is so stupid. Like, I love it. And, um, you know, you're like, shit, it's not punk rock enough. Maybe people won't like it. But I was like, you know, fuck that because you listen to the queers and there's some really mushy stuff on there, you know? And I love that about Joe. He just, he goes for it and it's, it's heartwarming, you know, and people, people do need a little balance with the, the tougher stuff, you know? So I think mm-hmm. that just maybe lets people know that I'm, I'm not all like a one trick pony, you know, there's more to me than that. I wouldn't say that I have any plans to like um, focus on one particular style and, let that guide me it's more like you know i just have to write what's good and then they'll fall into place as far as like a track listing or an album goes you know but um yeah not consciously trying to be more poppy or anything like that just trying to be as my mom said just try to be the best Susie you can be you know and so that's what i'm doing I thought it was interesting that you wrote a song, California, from, and you're from California, because I remember when I was a teenager growing up in the Boston area, 
And yeah. I, I, all I thought about was me and my friends, were like, we got to get to California. And I ended up moving to LA and working for record labels my whole life. And when I got there in the eighties, it was like, it was the greatest place in the world. So I, being a Californian to write this song is what I was like, wow, it's interesting. You would think someone from the Midwest would write a song like that, you know, but I was writing it from the Midwesterners point of view, you know, <laughs> and that job of a songwriter really and you know if you if you just google it how many songs about california are there you know like what's one more yeah, and right. that's so much about you know just the the magic of that place and um the allure that it has i love it's la a i love i love california and mostly la because that's where i lived and i was and i was just there in may and it was, and you know, some things have changed, but to me, that Pacific Ocean's still there. And I love oh, yeah. the South Bay, Bay and I love Hollywood. I used to work on Sunset and La Brea, so mm -hmm. uh, I, I love it. Um, Animal California Gold Record. I'm not, I'm not a man, which is great. Family memories. They're, they're all. The thing about your videos is, do, do you? First of all, I have to ask you: Do you style yourself, or do you have a stylist that you work oh. with? I am the stylist. You're yeah. your own stylist. Would never trust anyone to dress me. <laughs> no way. And I, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm really heavy on styling the boys in my band, but there's definitely they look good though. Suggestions and influence. Thing is, I don't want to. I don't want anyone to ever feel like not themselves. You know, and that's the important thing about style is really just highlighting and emphasizing like those uh kind of extra parts of you you know and just like turning it up a little bit making it a little louder i tend to go really loud and the boys don't feel comfortable being that loud but that's okay you know they look good in much simple items i'm so jealous of them they have it so fucking easy you know um i always said if i was boy man it would be so cool like boys you guys just you got you got like the classic thing, you know, you don't have to do that much and you just look so cool, you know? Um, that being said, I do love being a girl because it gives me all these options for different stuff, but you know, um, no, I've never worked with a stylist ever. And I don't see that working because I just have a very strong opinion about the way I want to look. Uh, your band, by the way, is very good. I just want Thank to say that. I mean, I've watched so many live videos of you guys cool. and it's always consistently fantastic. Um, yeah, they're great guys. Really, really talented. Speaking of live, um, I, you mentioned the queers a few minutes ago and that you have a bunch of dates with them. And mm -hmm. so you're, no, I didn't realize this until this morning when I looked at the schedule you're going to be out with the queers and then you're going out with age and orange and there's not very much time in between. You're mm -hmm. basically going from one tour to the other. Did, did the age and orange thing just drop down on your lap after you already had the queers thing booked? I mean, how did that. Actually, it's the other way around. The agent orange tour has been booked since last summer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, Oh, I need time off. We've been on the road all year. We're not going out at all until the agent orange tour starts right and then joe was like you guys want to do some dates with us and i was like i can't fucking say no to you you know so uh, we would any we love playing with the queers and joe is just such a cool dude i love being around him and he's got a really great fan base that he's built oh yeah people who appreciate songs talk about people who really get the music and are listening to the songs is well as like the live show you know um because he's a song dude and so yeah the the queers tour kind of like shortened our time off period and then we're not coming home in between those two tours we're going to book shows to lead us out to the agent orange tour it makes no sense to drive all the way back to the east coast and then back to arizona where the agent orange tour starts um and then basically the agent orange tour will end and we're going to fill up the week and a half between that and punk rock bowling so really we're leaving for tour on march 26th and i won't be home until about june 5th yeah, i was going to ask you about punk rock bowling that was a huge score for you yeah yeah again super blessed and uh, i wasn't sure if they were going to write us back but they did <laughs> i thought I, I thought i really blew it with la machina 
Yeah, did, uh, was there actually? I mean, uh, did, was that an act? Was there an actual date at punk oh, yeah. rock bowling? Because mm -hmm. I thought it was a, it wasn't remote. It was actually you were there. Uh, no, we didn't actually get to play because the pandemic. Right. So, got it all down. We did uh we did like a studio performance? Yeah, for that's a, real, yeah. The online that they did, but then we were going to be rebooked for the next year. And then I had to tell them that we didn't exist anymore. And I just wasn't sure if they still liked me after all of that, you know? And then I kind of had to earn my stripes again with the moon and have something, um, something to show them, you know, because for me, it's been a uh, punk rock bowling is just at the top of my list. Yeah. It's like, it's the, it's the coolest and most important punk rock festival in the world. I feel really, really strongly and similarly to Rebellion Festival. I would say that they're almost like twins, you know, twins in different countries. Um, and Rebellion is like family to me, but I've only played punk rock bowling once. I've been a bunch of times, you know, growing up and seen some of the most important shows I've ever seen there. But to, but to do that festival is like a really big accomplishment for me. And it was a huge goal. It was pretty much the only goal I had for Susie Moon Band was to have a really good slot at Punk Rock Bowling. And we have that now, you know, and now it's like, ah, it's real. You know, I'm like already working out for the, like at the gym for <laughs> Punk Rock Bowling, which is so far away, but you figure I'm in for, on, for like two months, you know? Cause it's like, you have to plan so far in advance and I still don't know what I'm wearing, you know, and like, blah. But um, I'm really excited and I just, I love what they've done. I think the festival is just like a really cool place, um, a great place to make memories and for people to be exposed to new bands, you know? So, um, and it's where I met my future husband. So in 2019, when Turbulent Hearts played there, um, my now fiance, his band out of DC called The Split Seconds, they were another band on that smaller stage we played about an hour apart and he and I got to talking about music and we realized that we, we loved all of the same bands, but like more than that, we just kind of were like the same, hill, right. you know? Yeah. And I was like, so refreshing because literally there is nobody cool in LA. <laughs> like I've been here my whole life, you know, <laughs> I just, you know, like, of course the man that I love would be from a totally different state across the country you know, and we just have been inseparable ever since. So he plays guitar in Suzy Moon. It's Drew Champion. And we decided to join forces. And really, this band would not be what it is without him. Um, he lends so much with his guitar playing and oh, takes, yeah. Great. takes shit off of my plate that I was trying to do in Turbulent Hearts, trying to do a little everything. And it's just too much work, you know, and he handles a lot of the business stuff and uh, it's more the analytical side, whereas I'm a little bit more of the right brain side, you know, so we complement each other really well. Um, and just to to have that built in support and somebody who's like, you know, um, rooting for the band and working for the band, you know, and we have that built in thing together. Do you guys self manage yourselves or do you have a manager? No, we uh, I mean, the last time I had a manager was with Savette. So, it was so you've long... been doing it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a booking agent, which is a huge help. And Pirates Press Records, they do a lot of stuff in-house that takes, um, you know, responsibilities off of my plate. Um, so it's it's a mix of DIY, but there's also a very important team. You know, our booking agent and the label, they do so much to help push this forward. Just one last thing, because you're Wait. awesome. You've been so cool. Um, when, when you're done with all this touring and everything, do you plan on going back to the studio? You know, every band wants to get back in the studio, and then another phone call for a tour comes up. <laughs> like, shit, do we go out and make money, or do we stay home and spend money? Mm. You know? And um, we haven't played everywhere yet. I know it seems like we've been on the road a lot for two years, but that's not enough to, you know, to have played these songs to everybody yet. You know, there are still a lot of places that we haven't been to, um, which is why I'm really grateful for both the Queers Tour and the Agent Orange Tour, because we're playing 
uh, more of the South and the Southeast, new cities that we haven't fucking been to yet, you know? So even though to me, it seems like, oh my God, we've been playing Dumb and in Love for two years, you know, but they haven't seen it, you know? So I, I do owe it to people who haven't gotten to see us perform yet to still perform those songs that are fresh to people, you know? Um, I, I've had kind of thrown some ideas around. I keep notes in my phone. I've got little melodies and things and stuff there, but I just really haven't had time to sit down and focus on writing. So, I mean, eventually it'll happen, but I'm not in any big rush to do it. I just thought I'd ask. I mean, I could see you guys ending up being on the road all summer long. Summer's we the all, best time to tour. So. All, we're already not going to be home until September, pretty much. Because after punk rock bowling, we'll be home for about three weeks before we go to Europe for two yeah. months. Europe's next. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So our second time in Europe, and we're again hitting new places. We're playing Romania. We're playing wow. Slovenia. We're playing Serbia. We're going to Spain. So again, new places. You know, um, Italy, more spots in France, which is really good. Um, and then we're going to be home. Uh, around August 15th um, and we've been submitted for a really big tour that starts late August and you know if uh, it's meant to be we'll do that you know but right now I just have to keep saying yes to the shows because that's what's getting us in front of the people who are gonna want new music you know so it's like it's really like I had the pandemic to work on music and everything leading up to that you know first call the shots record coming out and our first tours in 2021 but now it's like time to do the work out in the world you know and really um just uh, make the most of the investments that we made on the recordings and stuff and kind of balance things out i get it hey thank yeah. you very much for taking the time to talk to us i love your music i'm a huge thank fan and i appreciate you being here very much thank you are just a lovely interviewer and I had a lot of fun. Thank you for asking some thoughtful questions and spending some time with me. All right. All right. Good luck to you. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great day.